Seattle winters can be long and gray, but this past winter was particularly long and gray. A series of events made me really think about life. And maybe to distract myself from that, I realized something that sent me down a series of rabbit holes and on a journey of learning. I picked up a whole new skill set and built something I'm pretty proud of as a result. And I wanted to share the story of how that came into being. I have a degree in computer science and I've worked in artificial intelligence and machine learning at some of the largest companies in the world. What I realized though, is that while I've written hundreds of thousands of lines of code and delivered capability used by millions of people, I didn't really know how computers worked at their core. I mean, I understood how to manipulate programming languages to take the inputs that I had and turn it into the outputs that I wanted. But that's an understanding of the program language paradigms and can be very abstracted from the underlying operating system and the hardware that it takes to actually execute the runtime operations. The higher level the language is, the further you're abstracted from the underlying core. And I wanted to understand the core. It started with operating systems. I've used enough operating systems in my time. Linux, Windows, and all sorts of flavors of Unix. And then there's the Android and iOS variants. I was an early adapter of Linux and I always loved experimenting with them on hardware. I've played with tons of single board computers and systems on a chip. I even have a Pine phone for playing with Linux distros on a phone. In thinking about this, I realized that while I consider myself a power user of the operating system, I had never thought through how they worked. I have a grasp of the services they provide, but I didn't understand the end-to-end -end flow of how the basic commands I entered into the operating systems, whether I issue them through code, through shell commands, or through mouse clicks, how they were interpreted down to the CPU instruction level, and then how they came back out the other side. The first question that comes up whenever I start a new project is, what are my requirements? The goal was clear. I wanted to make a homebrew operating system, but what does success mean for building an operating system? I needed a solid answer for, what is an operating system anyway? I went searching for a definition. I found lots of different definitions. I started to collect them together and organize them into common themes and then prioritize them by authoritativeness of source until I felt like I had a well-supported statement of what an operating system is. Software that manages computer resources and applications and provides access to those resources to the user. There are a lot of caveats here, but for my purpose, this is a solid enough definition. Okay, now I had a solid definition of what an operating system is, but what does it do? Again, I went back to the internet and searched across a variety of sources, and based on the overlap, a common view started to emerge. An operating system should provide process management. That's things like starting, stopping, communication between processes and application and programs. I.O. management. That's abstracting input and output hardware from the user and programs. This includes stuff like keyboards, displays, and so on. File storage management. That's providing file access to users and programs on permanent storage. Then there's access to networking resources. There's security, and that's providing access control, memory protection, and the like. There's user shell, which is a graphical or text-based access to computer functions, and the memory management, about allocating and protecting memory resources for programs. So, I approached it like I usually do when I want to learn a new programming skill, and went looking for a tutorial. There are quite a few of them out there of various qualities and age, but one that caught my eye was by Philip Opperman on writing operating systems in Rust. I had never used Rust before, but somehow my brain thought it was a perfect time to kill two birds with one stone and learn a new language at the same time. So, I dove in. I named my OS Opus and started typing it in line by line to make sure I understood what each line did. The tutorial is based on x86 64-bit architecture and goes through development and stages, and what I quickly realized was that building an operating system is in large part about manipulating the underlying hardware, and the underlying standards and communication protocols on x86 are extremely advanced and extremely complex, carrying along with it years of crust. Basically, I realized that to build an operating system, you needed a full understanding of the underlying hardware architecture and protocols. Philip Opperman did an amazing job with this tutorial, and it's an invaluable learning experience, and I absolutely love the Rust programming language. 
but I didn't want to write an operating system for x86. So I went looking for a more straightforward architecture to base my operating system on. This led to a series of tutorials. After working through one based on ARM, specifically for the Raspberry Pi architecture, what I realized kept coming up were the same kind of questions. Why does UEFI boot work this way? What series of decisions led to this? What's the idea behind the mailbox protocol for rendering graphics anyway? In the meantime, winter was taken over by a particularly sweet spring in Seattle. The blooms were amazing. Color everywhere. Doing research into operating systems, I'd started watching some documentaries on early computers, and I became intrigued with homebrew computers from the 1970s and 80s. Especially when I discovered that many of them were based on one-off architectures designed with whatever chips and components were available to the maker. This made my brain wonder, could I make my own computer architecture and build a general purpose computer from it? I thought maybe I could if I took the same approach those early homebrew computer makers did and focused on using off-the-shelf components. So my new goal was to create a new hardware architecture for a general purpose computer and develop an operating system to run on that hardware. It should provide all the functionality we defined for an operating system, but do it on a unique hardware footprint. Also, I wanted it to be beautiful and reflect the spirit of those amazing early computers. In my view, this had evolved from a purely technical endeavor into something of a hybrid technical and artistic project. I wanted to make something interesting that would fit well with my personal spaces. So many of the design decisions that I make from this point onward aren't purely technical. They have a consideration towards my personal aesthetics. Chip design and instruction sets are interesting, but for my first pass, I wanted to keep it as high level as possible. If you haven't watched any of Ben Eater's channel, I advise you to do so. His series on building a breadboard computer from scratch is amazing, but I'm not at his level with hardware and electronics. I'm a software person who's never effectively used a soldering iron before. After a bit of research into what options were available, I chose to base my architecture on a cheap microcontroller units. Modern MCUs are actually quite advanced chips and often contain onboard flash, which would drastically simplify the overall design. They aren't nearly as powerful as a modern CPU though, so I knew I'd need several in my design. I did a lot of research. Adafruit and SparkFun became my best friends, and they're great resources. I started to build out the design a little bit, and I'd love to say that I built out full fritzing diagrams and planned out all the communication buses and all, but that's not how I rolled this. I didn't even have a basis for knowing what was possible, so I decided to take it one piece at a time and let the design grow organically as I learned. So I ordered some components, breadboards, and wires and started experimenting. There was a constant array of this stuff laid out on my desk as I learned the basics of bare metal programming with these little devices. This organic growth gave me an idea for the name of the computer and operating system, Ficus. It's a large family of trees, shrubs, and vines, some of which we use as houseplants because they're so vigorous and versatile. I use this metaphor a lot in the design language of the artistic piece, and it also appears in the code base. Through this experimentation, a basic design started to emerge that I thought would satisfy the requirements of being a computer. It all starts with the user and considering how they'll interact with the system. I'm used to interacting with computers through keyboards, so we'll start with a keyboard for basic input. To capture the input, I'm using an Adafruit Feather RP2040 with a built-in USB host. The software is based on Phil Howard's Pico Core and Tiny USB. I implement a basic USB host that evaluates incoming scan codes using a simple lookup table approach and I'm able to map them to ASCII fairly easily. The ASCII text is sent to display on a 20-character 4-line LCD and implements some very basic line editing capabilities. The idea here is that a user can use this to edit an input command before pressing enter to send it for processing. Now that the user can enter a command, we need something to process it. The little USB host needs to run at 120 MHz to align with the USB signal, and it just doesn't have enough clock cycles left over for meaningful processing. So I add another component to the design. Now that there are multiple nodes in place, I need to be able to communicate between them. I lean in on the metaphor again and call these connections vines. I go with UART for simplicity and define a simple protocol based on 8-bit messages. 
Once the user presses enter, the command is sent to the centralized processing node. It's really more of a router that connects all the other modules and routes messages between them. I lean into the ficus metaphor and call this the trunk. It's a Raspberry Pico RP2040 and the code is developed on bare metal using the Raspberry Pico C SDK. Now that we had a command from the user, I needed somewhere to run the command. I could run it directly on the trunk router node, but that node needed to stay free to route incoming events. So I added a worker node that could take the input, run the process requested, and then pass the output on. This time, I wanted to go with SPI for the data bus with the router acting as a controller node and added a peripheral node that could take the command, interpret it, and execute it. Now that we have input and processing nodes in place, it's time to display output to the user. For graphics processing, I'm using an Adafruit Metro M4 Express. The chip is 120 MHz Cortex M4, and its job is to listen for incoming events and ready them for display. To display output for the user, I'm using a 3.5 inch TFT screen, and I use the excellent display library from Adafruit and develop a simple user interface to display shell commands and responses, along with a startup screen. Now I had an MVP that works sometimes, when the wire stayed connected. I knew that there were lots of components left to add, but this would be enough to get started on the main build. Spring turned to summer. Seattle has beautiful summers, and this one was no exception. It was a perfect time to work with some real hardware. I used a basic 1x8 to be the backboard, or case, for my computer. I got some solderable PCBs to tie all the components together. They're a beautiful blue color and have an excellent pattern for distributing power and ground to the components. Initially, I'll put the main pieces in place to get a prototype working end to end. Now I have a prototype working on the board. There's still a lot of software to implement, but the end-to-end -end flow is working. There were some problems with this setup though, some transient grounding errors that I couldn't track down, and one of the Raspberry Picos stopped working. I had been short-sighted by soldering chips directly to the board. I should have used pin connectors to let me swap the components out. It was basically a redo, but since they are offset, it would improve the appearance and make wiring easier. Even though it was a lot more work, I was pleased with the redo. It looked a ton better and was easier to work on. I added a Wi-Fi capable Raspberry Pico to sync from a network service. <laughs> 
I added an SD card to provide storage for user space programs and wired it into the shell component. I added a real-time clock breakout with a battery backup and wired it to the internet connected component. Over the next weeks and months, I added additional components, a SparkFun Pro Micro RP2040 and a rail full of NeoPixel LEDs to act as status lights. Finally, I added a temperature and humidity sensor and a small dedicated display. Before I knew it, summer had turned to a beautiful fall, and then the long Seattle rain set in. It's been a long and challenging year, but I'm coming out the other side better for it, and things have ended up pretty well. What started as a distraction in hospital waiting rooms has blossomed into a new way of thinking about the world around me. The best part is that I ended up with a new set of skills and knowledge, and I use those learnings to build something I'm very proud of. I've continued working on the operating system, and it's coming along. The code is on GitHub. I'll post a link in the comments. So how did I do against my goals? Well, it fits the definition of a computer, and the operating system already fulfills most of the requirements we laid out. It supports user I.O. and clearly has a user shell. I implemented a good chunk of the Unix shell commands. It also supports rudimentary file management and text file editing, and the shell can even run and manage user-written programs, meaning you can write new programs directly on the machine itself. Is it a good computer? No, it's not. It has a 1-bit data bus and the screen has something like a 2 Hz refresh rate, and the shell is known to lock up fairly frequently. But it's my computer that I thought up and built, and I like to think of it as an artistic expression. I imagine it as a puzzle for some future person to find at a yard sale and wonder about its place in history. This was a fun project, and the time spent learning and growing has been invaluable. It's given me a lot of comfort in the distraction. There are reasons for me to believe that next year will be a better year for me and my family. I hope the same for you. Thanks for watching.